With over 35 years of ministry, Mount Zion Church is located in Clarkston, Michigan. You may have seen us while driving a I-75 just north of Great Lakes Crossing. We invite you today to join us as we go inside to hear a fresh and relevant word in this new day. Mount Zion, helping you experience the best life. Uh, the last couple of days, I've been kind of getting my office in order to just kind of at the end of the year, oftentimes I'll get this idea that I want to get a little bit more order to what I'm doing so I can be a little bit more productive. And going through this uh, old cabinet I have in the basement it has a lot of different books and stuff. I'm like, well, I don't need that anymore. I don't need that anymore. Found an old notebook in there that had sermon notes going way back into the early uh, 1980s. And uh, I've never really preached from notes. That's why somewhere along the line I said, well, I don't need to have a pulpit in front of me because I'm not really using notes. So I might as well just go uh, through the Spirit just like I always have. But I always still kept notes. And one of the reasons I did in the early days is I didn't want to repeat myself. Because I'm always like, I, I want to make sure that I write this down because I don't want to just a few months later say the same thing or whatever. And I, I was always feeling funny about repeating stories or anything like that. And I remember one time I was in prayer and I was thinking about a thought and I'm like, I already talked about that thought. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, well, you're always saying that you want to preach on Sunday morning what I give you. What if I want you to repeat it? <laughs> well, I never thought of that. So I guess if you want me to repeat a sermon just one week to the next, I better do it. Right, Lord? So I no longer worry about repeating things and actually find out that repeating stories over time uh, gives the story to the house, so it becomes our story together. So I, I think that's very important. And of course, as I was going through those notes, I noticed the scripture from November 1983, and I was sharing how in a time of prayer, the Lord spoke something to me. Now, when we first started the church uh, back in 1978, I was 24 years old. Uh, we had a miraculous entry into our very first building down on Clintonville Road. We still own the building, but it was just a few years old when we bought it. So it was a really nice building and it seemed very, very big for us as a congregation because there's only about 30 of us. And it was definitely a building way beyond our financial means that we could purchase. And uh, however, God made a way through faith. As I was in prayer one day, he said, if you go the way of spirit, you'll possess things that others have not possessed before. And to me, that was the way of faith. Listen to what God has to say, go in and take the land. And that night, I felt like God said, you know, you guys can't afford that building, but if you go by faith, you'll be able to take possession of that building. And uh, I, I remember telling everybody that. We were all excited. And I remember that when we first uh, went to look at the building, the guy said, well, you need to go to the bank and try to get a mortgage because we certainly ha didn't have money to pay the cash. And uh, we were like, no bank's going to loan us money. And they said, well, if you go to the bank and get turned down, maybe they'll give you a land contract. So we did that. And, of course, they turned us down. And uh, we offered a land contract. At the time, it was like 40000 down is what we offered. Uh, and uh, I think the whole cost of the building was like 220000 which seemed like an amazing amount of money back there in 1978 with our small number of people. Uh, so we offered forty down, land contract of 180000 And the guy come back, and he's like, uh, they said they'll take the land contract if you'll give them 45000 down. I'm like, well, we don't have forty, so I might as well offer forty five. What difference does it make? Didn't tell the realtor that because he wasn't a person of faith. Matter of fact, I think after he found out about the story, he hasn't talked to us since. And that was a long time ago. But anyway, we uh, agreed to that and uh, had the faith. And I, I remember, however, a couple of weeks before we were getting uh, close to the closing, we were way short of the amount of money. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, am I crazy or something? Did God really? How many have ever had these things where you think God spoke to you, but when it don't look too good, you think, well, maybe he didn't speak to me. I know there were people who were telling me he wasn't speaking to me, so <laughs> as I was thinking about these things, and uh, that's when I was at work, and I worked at a grocery store back then, and I, I was just walking through the store, and all of a sudden, a song came to me, give me faith, Lord, to believe in miracles, and, and, and so I began to hear that faith word from the Lord, and the Lord gave me that song, and from that song, we started singing it, and faith came back, and we went in and took possession of that building. But the word that I wrote in the book that day was, 
as I was thinking about then the purchase of this property we have here, because we bought that building miraculously in 78, moved in in 79. We actually had to build an addition in 1980. In 1982, we doubled the size of the auditorium. So we were growing, building, and we never seemed to have enough money, but always were able to pay the bills. And that's when, amen. That's when the Lord spoke to me about buying the property down here, which was 52 uh, acres at the time. And again, a great sum of money. And I remember thinking, Lord, when are we going to have enough money? Anybody have prayed that prayer before? He says, you always have enough money. I'm like, no, I want to have a bunch of money. So I just write <laughs> checks, you know. And, and, and that's when the Lord spoke to me. He said, "You'll c come time in your history when you'll look back and you'll say, as other people will say, how did you do all these things? And I'll say, well, this is my father's house and this is his provision. <laughs> Amen. Well, when the Lord spoke that to me and I was thinking about all this as I'm reading through these notes because I was telling the whole story of my prayer in these notes. And, and I, at that time, when the Lord spoke that to me, I had revelation and all of a sudden it didn't seem like an impossible situation. It didn't seem like something that was out of reach. I didn't feel like just a 24-year-old kid wondering what was going on in the future. At that time, of course, a few years older. But I, I was a person who was seen from God's perspective. How many you know we can see through God's perspective? And, and as I look back over the prophecies throughout the years, and, and God has spoken to us, sometimes you don't really know what those prophecies mean until you get to the point in time when they're fulfilled. But one thing I can tell you, the prophecy always came to us, and what it did is it changed our perspective of our situation. Sometimes it changed our perspective about ourselves, And that's why, as a people, how many know we need revelation from God? Amen? And so it's been a wonderful journey, but God is good in all these things. In Isaiah 61, I've been preaching this on Sunday mornings. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. Can you say amen to that? And I believe the same anointing that was on Jesus Christ is on the church today. How about you? And of course, verse 3 kind of affirms the same thing where it's talking about uh, exchanging our sadness for joy, giving us the ability to come out of prison houses, etc. But the emphasis the Lord began to speak to me this morning was to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn in Zion. And, and, and I really believe with all my heart that the Lord is saying how important it is at this time that we would understand this is an acceptable time. That word acceptable means a time of favor. And it isn't just like a year period of time. It's talking about this is the beginning of it. This is the year that says this is when you're going to begin to see the change, says the Lord. This is the time frame for God to bring us into a new day. Can you say amen to that? I believe... This is a time for us to proclaim the acceptable year of our God, the time of favor. The Bible says that the Lord has favored Zion and that the set time is upon us, but also the day of vengeance of our God. And I want to explain to you more what that means as we go through the message, but I believe it's very important for us to realize we're in a very special season and time in God. Now, having said that, I want to go to the story in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus himself is literally reading from that same book, the book of Isaiah. And after he reads out of Isaiah, those scriptures we've been reading, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So I'll bear witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Now, I... I, I Today, as I was thinking about this and praying, the Lord just began to speak to me, kind of put me in that setting there. Can you imagine if you were in the synagogue that day and uh, you heard this young guy about 30 years of age getting up and they said, well, it's your time to read. And they handed him the book of Isaiah, which was a very important prophetic book for them. And so he just did what his job was, and that was read Isaiah 61, and it's all those scriptures we've been reading and talking about here on Sundays, uh, about the wonderful ministry. And then for him to say, 
Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, how do we know for those people, they're kind of like, yeah? We've been reading these scriptures for about six or seven hundred years. We all love the book of Isaiah, and we all look for the coming of the Messiah. But for you to say, this day it is fulfilled in your ears, and young man, you're supposing that you're the one that's going to be the fulfillment of these prophecies? Can you imagine it wasn't a well-received thing? Now, there were people there who, in hearing him and seeing the charisma that he carried, marveled at this, but their response, of course, is, is this not Joseph's son? In other words, when he was speaking in the anointing, people were like, wow, there's something going on here. This is, this is just something different. But then all of a sudden, they kind of get back into their natural thinking. I mean, you know, you can go to church, you can hear something very wonderful, and then you're driving home, and all of a sudden the wrong thing happens. Maybe somebody cuts you off, whatever, and all of a sudden you're back to the old you. And sometimes it can happen real quick in church. You can think, wow, that was wonderful. That was great. Yes, the Lord's moving. All of a sudden you're like, uh, no, that's, that's just Joseph's son talking. Could there be something here? And, and it becomes so easy for us to get ourselves out of the spiritual perception or recognizing that the Lord is speaking and all of a sudden just go back to your old thinking or your natural line of thought. And he, speaking of Jesus, said, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Now, obviously, Jesus' ministry has already started. There are people talking about it, rumors, if you would, words going around. Wow, this Jesus, you know, there's something about him. Did you hear about the stories over in Capernaum? Did you hear about the miracle that happened over here? And rumor has it that he was out in the wilderness and the devil himself came to him and he overcame him. And there was just like a fresh touch of God upon him. Everybody's talking about all these things. But Jesus could read the minds of the people as they're getting kind of in the natural and they're like, hey, you can work miracles out of town. Why can't you work miracles here? I remember years ago when I was trained for the ministry, I went to a church in Detroit, Bethesda Missionary Temple, and it was a church of uh, thousands of people. And way back in the early 70s, there weren't nearly uh, too many mega churches around. So a church that large was very unusual. And I remember we were there for what they called conventions, which was their special services. And they would have special speakers and one of the services. So one guy was preaching. He was just really a good speaker and everything like that. And I'm like, wow, this guy's really great. And uh, afterward, I had an opportunity to meet him. And I was talking to somebody that knew him. And they were telling me that he was a pastor in California. And they were telling me he had a church of about two or 300 people. When they're talking about this guy, I'm like, he's kind of shrinking in my ideas about him, like, Wow, when he's in this big mega church preaching, he sounds so good. You're thinking, wow, he's really something. Then you find out, well, in his own church, he's not very successful. It's just a small church. And they're telling me all these stories, and all of a sudden, he's kind of shrinking. And uh, it, it was funny because it wasn't long after that where James Wheel, the pastor, was saying, you know, the definition of a big shot is a little shot out of town. And I thought, I just had the revelation of that earlier here today. Uh, but the truth is, of course, uh, when you're out of town, you can kind of get your own uh, point of view of somebody in that setting and not really know the reality of it. But uh, sometimes we have a tendency to naturally survey a person rather than be in spiritual perceptive of the gift. Amen. Now, concerning the day of vengeance, however, I wanted to point this out in First John 3. It says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, I don't have time to develop this whole subject. This reference of Scripture isn't saying when you're a Christian, you don't make any mistakes. But it does tell you that when you're in the way that God has you to walk in, how do you know you can overcome anything? How many know the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? But what I wanted you to understand that when the Bible talks about the day of vengeance, the vengeance of God, when Jesus Christ come, was against what? It was against the enemy. 
It was against the devil. God wanted to put him in his place. Through Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, the vengeance was upon the enemy. The vengeance was upon the system that had been created because when Jesus Christ came, he came to announce the reign of the kingdom of God and the utter destruction of the reign of the enemy. So when we think about the day of vengeance, we should see not so much what God's going to do to us who aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing or whatever. We should look that God wants to put his vengeance against all things that oppress people and hold them back from him. That's why when I look for the day of God to begin to move upon the land, I believe a God who's more powerful than any political system, any earthly system. I believe in a God who says, when I come, I can break the strongholds that would hold my people back. There's nothing too difficult for our God. But we should see the day of vengeance as God's vengeance against our enemy and enemies, if you would. In Matthew 12, he said, Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first, what, binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He will not, who he was not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You see, Jesus, when he came, announcing the vengeance of God, he announced that he was going to bind the strong man, the devil, who had taken the authority in the place that God intended for man, he didn't do it because he had the power with it himself to do it. He did it because mankind abdicated that to him. And God, in his mercy, was going to take it back and give it back to us. Amen? How many glad that's the kind of God you serve? Who says, you may have lost it, but I'm going to get it back, says the mighty God. Because I want to give it to you another time, says the Lord. I want to... Release my vengeance upon that which has destroyed you, that which would be a curse for you. So Jesus Christ says, I have come to bind the strong man so that you can make a plunder of his goods. And Jesus said, he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. In other words, don't sit on the fence. You got to understand, this is not a day to sit on the fence and just let the world take its place but this is a time for the people of God to say wait a second the enemy has been destroyed God has given us the victory greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and we're supposed to war church from a position of victory it would be easy to watch the headlines hear the news and think how could we ever win this war of the social things that are going on in the world today? And unfortunately, sometimes when you hear ministers talk, they will kind of help layer you with all that depression and oppression that says it's a hopeless situation. What are we going to do? I want to announce to you what Jesus announced. I came to bind the strong man, says the mighty God. And I did so that you could take a spoil of the goods. Don't sit on the fence and say, what can be done? Say, with God, all things are possible. And that's not just in our nation. That's not just in our country. That's in your life, says the mighty God. And just like it was with the enemy in the beginning, so it is with us so many times. The things that we suffer are because of choices we've made along the way, whether they were actual choices or just letting things happen. But I want you to know something. The Lord says in the day of vengeance, look for me to destroy even that thing that's trying to take over you. And you would say, well, I let it happen. God says, I want you to know something. I want to give you faith perception, says the Lord, where you see the enemies defeated and you see that I give you power over all things, says the mighty God, and that I've called you to war from a position of the battle has already been one says the mighty God what is the song we sang today could you feel the anointing our God a mighty warrior hallelujah our God is a mighty warrior church and the victory has already been won that's why I love to go back to the story of Joshua and Caleb as they were coming to the promised land. Moses is leading the children of Israel to the promised land. He's been there to deliver them from Egypt. 
He's taken them through the wilderness, but when they come to the promised land, they send spies into the land. And the spies come back and say, the land's everything God said it would be. The problem is there are giants in the land. And so the people said, we're not going to go and die at the hand of those giants. We're not going to go into the land. Why did God do this to us? Moses, why did you do this to us? Why did you tell us about what could be good for us or what wonderful things are going to happen and then bring us to the point where within ourselves we say this can happen are you like joshua and caleb you see another supernatural meal or you like the others who say we can't do that god wants to take the we can't do that out of us amen church he wants us to know he needs a people that are hungry to say Jesus Christ was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus Christ was manifested in order that he might break the stronghold of everything that would hold us back. Jesus Christ came and he announced that it's a year of favor and he also announced the vengeance of our God. He came, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the open in a prison to them that are bound. Oh, how Hallelujah, church. It's time to come out of the prison houses. It's time to have the broken hearts mended. It's time to get the spirit of joy for the spirit of heaviness. It's time for us to give up our mourning. It's time for us. And the thing that seems like it would stop us is the very nutrients we need in this day. That's why Isaiah also said, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn, for this is the heritage of the saints. Could you read that with me? You shall condemn because this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. What is your heritage? Well, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Now verse 16 says that God has created the blacksmith who blows the coals on the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy. The spoiler isn't for his people, amen? Sometimes he will use the fire as the blacksmith to form us and to shape us. So sometimes these situations are going to occur in our life and they're going to be used for God by God. But in the end, he wants you to know something. You're not going to ever have a weapon that will prosper against you, says the Lord. Wow. That's what I call the day of vengeance of our God. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Now, that's a good thing, but I want to tell you something. That's even the tongues, the voices that come from your own head. Because how many know sometimes when you're going through something and things aren't going so well, the voice you're going to hear is not the people around you, but it's going to be the voice from your past. It's going to be the voice that reminds you of things from yesterday or mistakes you've made and said, well, you can't possibly expect God to do that for you. You can't possibly think there's still that prophecy that's going to come to pass. You can't possibly. Sometimes that gets in your head. And that's when you have to say, wait a second. Without a revelation, without spiritual perception, I'm going to listen to the wrong voice and I'm not going to hear the voice that says this is the acceptable year. This is the day of vengeance of our God. God has anointed Pastor Lauren to reach the church with a fresh message for this day. If you would like further information, we also invite you to visit us on the web at mountzion.org where you can hear more of Pastor Lauren's messages and find out about our ministries. If you're visiting the Metro Detroit area, we invite you to worship with us at Mount Zion Church. Thanks again for watching.